All right. Welcome back, Chelsea fans, to another episode of the London's Blue Podcast. I am, of course, Nick. No Dan tonight. Dan gets a night off every once in a while. We have to we have to do that. Uh, before we dive in, we have a couple of fun things to start off the show with because we're we're just in a good mood right now. First things first, we want to debut our new UEFA Conference League stinger. Hit it, Jake. The conference. The conference. The conference. <laughs> Now, uh, you'll note uh, that that is not the official Conference League uh, song, and uh, we just wanted to have some fun with it since I think everyone's just accepted that we're a part of this very real and uh, very intense and definitely legitimate competition with uh, 35 other teams (laughs) at this stage. So we just thought we'd have some fun. So if you hear the sad recorder with our terrible singing on top of it, it's incredibly important that you take that pod seriously. And that's what we need to do. Second thing, and this is even more important than the stinger, which I love. Uh, welcome back to the show, Brandon Busby. How are we doing? That's that's good. I appreciate you prefacing that me coming back is better than that stinger. <laughs> I, I mean, only by a smidge. I mean, yeah, the stinger is pretty fair, good. Fair. No, yeah. that, that's reasonable. So, yeah, look, uh, hilarious timing on this as well because uh, <laughs> I, got, I got a tweet and uh, the timing you- was epic. Would you like to read the tweet and share it with the with for, for sure? Enzo Matic was like, So was this BB Busby fired? Did he quit? Guy has a kid and acts like an hour podcast twice a week is difficult, blowing an incredible opportunity, my guy. <laughs> Look, you're not wrong. Look, like, first of all, correct. Up. I am blowing this. I mea culpa. I I agree. Uh, but is what it is, and here I am. So Look, enough, enough, uh, enough pressing me on Twitter and I, X and I, I might just show up. So this might be the recipe for success, Nick. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, he turns out he wasn't fired uh, on his off day, uh, guys. Uh, you know, we we said back at the uh, the start of the season that, you know, the, the podcast would be kind of a rotation thing that he would kind of make it in and out as as schedules allowed and look it was nice because dan was on all the pods last week we're giving him a little bit of break and you know it's important there are a lot of matches it's early in the season you don't want to get you know off to a sprint and then have to slow down so this is uh wonderful to have you back brandon for sure and obviously look sub to youtube you see me there every week like i'm yeah. very much still a part of things but hey that's fine i appreciate that uh you went the hour long uh you know conversation so uh yeah let's rock it let's get into it of course just call to action really quick amazing community you guys are absolutely killing it for us right now youtube has been on fire so thanks for those who have subscribed and made that a fun place for us to kind of test and learn on some new uh, content and, and things that we want to do over there, especially the Chelsea women's content recently. Uh, of course, if you want to join the Discord, uh, you should do that and sign up for the Dispatch because Sam has been uh, cranking out some incredibly interesting newsletters recently. And of course, the old Apple Podcast, Spotify, that always helps us. But um, Brandon, you know what? I'm, you're going to host this thing. You're going to get back into the host chair, get that thing all warmed up, and uh, I'll just play color commentary today. How about that? For sure. Let's rock it. Well, Kicking it right to you right away. As always, before we get into the action, we want to kick it off like we always do with the three-word match review. Uh, and uh, let's see, what what did the people say? It's all it's all positive vibes. Yeah, look, of course it's positive vibes. And, you know, some combination from Twitter, uh, some combination from Discord. Uh, so Def Jux Daddy with Nita right back. We have two of them. They're just not always healthy, my guy. Uh, Craig Ledoux with uh, Ghent. Old men and ballers, uh, gentlemen and ballers, nice. Uh, Robert Hoon Calter with Portugal, Portuguese, Portugals. <laughs> I like that. Uh, journalism RP with second 11 win. Uh, Kate, uh, Kate Bryce with uh, Vegas valuable versatility. Hemp hens with chips, not fries. That's right in your face, Belgium. Uh, Matt Fitz with vote for Pedro, the old Napoleon dynamite. That's wonderful. Uh, and Spanish Joe with Chelsea's prowess emergent um, it, with Ghent being, of course, the play on words there. I would go with Chelsea's emergent prowess, maybe. But either way, good. 
For sure. Uh, look, I put free Vega bombs. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is old enough like me to oh. completely had way too many Vegas bombs in, in college. But uh, yeah, free Vega bombs. How about it? Uh, mine was in Vega reading uh, UCL start or UECL start. Uh, this is a pretty decent, pretty decent match. We're going to have good vibes in this one, Brandon. I, uh, whenever I see U E C L for whatever reason, I just like pronounce it my name or like pronounce it in my head. I just, I look at it and I go, that's the U uncle. Like, (laughs) and to be fair, I feel like that's about as serious as you should take this, like a 36 team American style bracket. (laughs) Like I'm surprised not playing everyone home and away for 74 matches minus two. So whatever. But, uh, yeah, like we're, we're, we're here to win the U uncle ladies and gentlemen buckle. That's right up uh but yeah so our opponents were ghent but it's k-a-a ghent conan klitschke atletia tech associate ghent or simply known by their nickname de buffaloes which i find to be way better than yeah, me butchering the belgian at the beginning of that but what a name here it was uh this past thursday october 3rd in the conference league yeah at the bridge, Chelsea four against two coming at you with Keenan. Uh, I guess start at the bottom, uh, Vega in the 12th minute, Neto 46th. Uh, Watanabe comes back with a little bit of momentum for getting the 50th minute, and Kunku 63rd, and then Dewsbury Hall wrapping up in the 70th before Gandelman knocks in the 90th. As Mareska said, the players had essentially stopped playing. Uh, but Nick, what about the lineup? How do we get to this magical scoreline? Well, the, as as you'll note in, in many of our previous pods, first 11, second 11. This is a second 11 opportunity for Chelsea Football Club. And uh, look, Enzo Maresca did make the full second uh, 11 come to life here. Uh, Philip Jorgensen making it into to the goalkeeper spot. Uh, Axel De Sassi, captain and right back on the evening. Largely right center back, though, when you break it down. Tosin Adarabayo, Benoit Badiashil, Renato Vega, Kieran Dewsbury Hall and Cesare Cassidy making another appearance in midfield as the midfield pair. Uh, Pedro Neto, Joao Felix, Mikhailo Mudrik, and Christopher Nkunku as the starting lineup. Mark Guiu uh, gets into the game. Tyreek George gets into the game, but a lot of unused subs in this one. Uh, Sanchez, Bergstrom, Kukure, Colwell, Fernandez, Matoweke, Kaiseido, and Keanu Dyer. Would really like to see Dyer get some minutes today. Um, but yeah, it was it was a full eleven switch up, Brandon. This is, uh, you know, kind of what I think you're going to see in the uh, what we're calling the thirty sixth uh, team league stage mm-hmm. of the of the competition. If you are unfamiliar with the format, I'm just going to read some quick rules here for you. Um, the biggest change is to the group stage, which will become this thirty six team league stage. Each side faces six different teams teams at home. Uh, three at home, three away, I should say. The top eight overall advance directly into the round of 16, whereas the sides finishing ninth to 24th will contest knockout round playoffs with the victors going through to the last 16. From then on, it is a straight knockout tournament. Tell me how much of that you're excited for. Brandon Busby, go. Yeah, I think when we were doing, I did a video and we are trying to look at just like how many matches we're going to play. And I was like, do we have the squad for this? Like in part of it is because this, this competition is endless and thank gosh, we, it came in at like the third or fourth stage. I mean, teams started playing in July for July 11th. Yeah. For, for the qualification for this. So look, I think again, like again, it was all on YouTube broke this down. I think the rosters roster decisions were correct. You look at the, against UEFA coefficient, their European ranking is 49th. Chelsea's is 11th. So that just shows you it's a pretty big gap between the two. So yeah, they, they should be. I think it's a luxury to have Nkunku in your second 11, but obviously he's been coming off the bench pretty regularly. Uh, even to have Neto, right? Is that Matoweke over Neto is, granted Neto's new, but like Matoweke inconsistent last season, like big statement from him to, to see that. So I think that there's some like good signs, especially that like you saw cohesion in this group with even a DCC right back. Um, but I think a lot of it was the the low level of Gens, uh, which made it easy, but a lot of goals coming from a lot of different players, which is uh impressive. 
but also yeah. he it looks like it looks like um Maruska is pretty reasonable and fair with these young players, which I would hope so, having been the Man City PL2 coach. Yeah, and, and just a huge shout out to Keanu Dyer, who was named on the bench for the first time. Like obviously didn't make it into the game. That's the next step for him, but not bad you know, for between, 17. Yeah, yeah. 17 years old between him, Tyreek George, and, and Josh Achiempong, uh, which is the better way to pronounce it than what I was saying earlier. Uh, these are the next three, right? That are pretty clearly gonna come through. And my hope is that, you know, Chelsea are I have no up in one of these games and these guys get real experience in this competition, you know, because the, the Academy guys don't cost you anything to, to bring on the squad. They're like the, the B, um, the B talent for, uh, the, the squad composition, uh, from the way that UEFA does their squad builds. So yeah, just, just a thought for him and, and hopefully Keanu gets on the next time. A hundred percent. All right. Some of the top level stats, Chelsea with an overwhelming 70% possession at home. We had 2.26 XG, which is great overperforming that pretty significantly had five big chances to their two. Uh, we had 20 total shots to their nine, only one goalkeeper save a piece, 10 corner kicks, to their four. Um, I mean, I, I just one caution a piece, which is, which is pretty straightforward and good to see. I think when I was looking through the, the stats, uh, we, in terms of our our big chances out of the the five, right? We scored two, missed three. So all right, hey, we're scoring most of the time. We're just talking about the ones we missed, um, but also like Ghent, you know, they scored both of their goals off of their two big chances. So it, it, they did convert when we we gave them those those opportunities. But I mean, forty three touches in the penalty area versus their twenty, Nick. Like it just. It was all Chelsea for a, a lot of the game. And I think the nice thing is it wasn't chippy. It was very straightforward. And Ghent tried to play. They had some really good pass movements and, and opportunities to the match. It just seemed like they weren't doing they, they weren't having a lot of success breaking the 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 press. Yeah, I mean, I think for the first 30 minutes of this game, possession was like 95 to 5, which, you know, was even extreme for us, at, you know, finishing with 70%. This was this is a game that Chelsea basically played in their half. You know, I think Ghent sent out properly to play a low block and to frustrate Chelsea and to make this not a whole lot of fun. Um, and and look, I mean, for the better part of, of the first half, Chelsea were only 1-0 up. And, you know, you go into half one nil up, anything can happen. And then you come out in the second half and I think really start to to put it together. And, you know, credits again, too, like you said, like the, the, a lot of their better chances came late in the second half. They weren't giving up. You know, their subs had a, a pretty decent impact. They've started playing some long balls over the top. And, you know, this is a, a learning experience for this group of very, very young players that even though they're what, 47th or 49th in the coefficient, they're still going to try and punch you in the mouth just as, as much as Man City will. And uh, the, the difference is, do they have the talent to do it consistently? These guys scored two goals today against mm -hmm. us. You know, Brighton scored two goals against us at the weekend. So, um, yeah, I, my, I, my hope is that these matches, you know, while they are easy wins, are not so easy that the the team gets comfortable, you know, and, and for kind of forgets that it's, this is for real. Like, this is a very real competition, as much as I made fun of it at the top of the show. Yeah, it's it's both and, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> and when you have this much rotation, you know, it's it's focusing. To to remind everybody, so Ghent had 0.99 XG, so they also doubled mm -hmm. uh, their, their XG as well. So it all kind of plays into it. Uh, how about this insider information from OG Ollie G on the shithouse mode of the match? Yeah, so... <laughs> So I was I was kind of searching for one because it was a pretty clean game. Like there wasn't a whole lot of shit house going on. I think Pedro Neto's celebration was kind of fun and whatever. But um, apparently the Ghent fans were were very very aggressive and uh, had a lot of fun today. And and why not? Why, why wouldn't you if you were Ghent coming to Stanford Bridge having a good time? Uh, apparently they were they took a chair like part part of a chair back in. Uh, in the away end and, and threw it at a Chelsea fan. Like there's some shit house we going on there, but then during, when they scored their first goal, they all got out there uh, as, as our friends across the pond, like to call them their cell phone torches. We would say a cell phone flashlight here on this side of the pond. 
and they were doing some sort of like dance with it. And then the Chelsea fans responded in kind with the following two goals and did that all around the stadium and had some fun. And uh, Ollie's description, uh, Ollie Glanville, friend of the show, Ollie's description is uh, they uh, we we sang at their at their celebration. What what the fucking hell is that? So when we scored the fourth, we all put our flashlights on to take the piss. Some of them applauded. You know what? I like this. I We need more of this sort of good-natured, less of the chair-throwing, more of the good-natured banter between the teams here, Brandon, because that's uh, that's pretty funny. I enjoyed it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and look, that's, you're going to get that. That is uh, football fandom 101, right? Mm-hmm. If uh, you have a thing and you do it in our stadium – And then we score, we're doing it right back. So uh, absolutely love it. The fact that they applauded too is like, hey, they're here for it. They knew what they were up to. And it was a proper uh, battle of the supporters, which you you love to see. So awesome, awesome stuff from both sides. Hey, we're going to take a real quick break. When we get back, uh, can the B team kick it? Let's see what's up. Thank you to the sponsors. And we'll be right back. All right, look, B team, second team, second 11. Naz asking this in the presser. Love to see it uh, everywhere. And... It's going to be important with the amount of matches, the level of competition, the fact that we can't take Premier League or domestic cups for granted anymore, Nick. We are in a rebuild phase. It is important that we find out how good is our B team. Can they cut it? Can they run through this? And it looks like they definitely passed the test tonight. Yeah, Maresca came out with some good quotes after the game. And I like... I imagine he wasn't thrilled at giving, you know, away two goals, but he said it was a good performance. And overall, I'm happy with the performance and the result. It was a tough game. We approached it very well. Every game is complicated. It's never easy. We changed players, but you could see the identity and the purpose of the team. For sure, we can do many things better. The most important thing we can learn tonight is that even if you are 4-1 up, you have to switch on until the final whistle. You cannot switch off. We conceded the second goal because we saw the game was finished. If we want to be one step forward, even if it's 4-1, we have to continue and not concede another goal. Um, and then uh, Ben Jacobs got the additional quote here on the identity. Uh, Enzo Baresca said the identity is clear, but we can do many things better. Tonight we attacked uh, well against a low block. Defensively, we pressed uh, very well and tried to recover immediately when we lost the ball. And Brandon, I think for, for me anyway... Flashback to preseason, flashback to, you know, the nervousness I think many of us had heading into the season about how well is the team going to adapt? How well is Enzo going to adapt to the team? All these sorts of things. And if he's going to get that sort of identifiable performance, you know, he says identity, I'm going to use identifiable here for how the B team plays and they, and they're able to play with some cohesion. They're able to play with some joy you know, a lot of, you know, we'll talk about some of the individual performance here in a little bit, but like if he's able to get that sort of, you know, that sort of team riled up, that's a good thing. I mean, that's a really, really good thing. So here's how I look at it. And this is one of my huge concerns coming into the season was with Maresca. How quickly can he get his message to land with the players? We started to see a little bit of it coming out of preseason, but I was like, it's not there yet. And you just think back to Potter and like even a Maurizio Sarri, where like they have such a distinct style, you know, we're talking about his like inverted fullbacks and things like that. It is very unique. Will it land? And is he going to have enough time to like see it out to Christmas? And what happens if it doesn't happen? So far, so good in terms of that. And I was only thinking of the starting 11, maybe 13, 14 players to do it. How he has this down on across the entire roster is either luck or genius. And it's still too early to tell, but that's a lot of players to get minutes and reps and training and things like that and be able to play. So um, it helps you're playing on Thursday because it gives you extra days to train mm-hmm. after the weekend. And we're playing on Saturdays, which is helpful and all these stuffs. But I t- it, it is impressive. It's the hardest thing in management to get your ideas across to a group of players who speak all these different languages who are coming from different setups. He's now the third manager, fifth manager in three seasons for some people, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been impressive. Yeah. I, th- I think two things I take away from this is like, 
I think especially for guys who feel like they should be in the first team, right? In the in the first eleven, like in Kunku in particular, um, maybe even someone like Tosin or, or something like that. It has to be hard to be in the B team, right? Like I think just genuinely a guy like Nkunku did not come to Chelsea to play in, in UEFA Conference League games, <laughs> right? He, he came to play in the big boy competition. And because we did not reach that last season, you know, now he is doing this. But I do think, get, you know, getting this team game time does a world of good for them, for their spirit, to feel like they're contributing to the larger group. Right. And that they're not just passengers on this ride for the first 11 to go take care of business every single week. And it's really, really important uh, from a game time perspective, because there are many, many matches that will be coming too soon. Right. Festive fixtures coming up, you know, over the holidays where you're playing every two, three days, it feels like where these guys are going to have to be ready to be first 11s. Right. They're going to have to. Because, you know, with our injury record and, and knock on wood, it's not been so bad this year. It's been a huge lift. But it is critical that a lot of these guys, six, seven, eight of these guys, are able to be consistent performers for this team. Otherwise, you're you're going to be looking at the team and, and looking at the squad and going, oh, man, we're awfully thin. Right? And I would say that the more impressive thing at the start of the season for me is that the midfield – has been pretty patchwork. Lavi has been hurt for, again for a lot of the the season. Uh, Reese James has been hurt for the basically the entire season so far. Um, there's been little injury blips here or there, but the team has stuck with it. They stuck with the game plan and they're scoring goals for fun right now, which is a uh, really, really, really good thing to see. And one of the things that we we just wanted to note here is that. You know, Chelsea have adapted their shape to kind of every game that they played this year. We. You know, we find these on SofaScore. You can find the average position maps, you know, for where each player was uh, in relation to their to their entire performance. And today was very much like a, a three at the back sort of performance because Vega was so uh, highly pushed up on the left hand side with him and Mudrik. But you saw a performance where there was really a jumble in midfield. I think to make up for the inexperience of Cassidy and maybe the fact that. Uh, Dewsbury Hall is not like a number six yet, but Nkunku and Felix were dropping way deep, allowing Neto and Mudrik to kind of lean forward a little bit. And you really just had that back three covering a lot of different space, which I did think kind of hurt us on some of those counterattacks, Brandon, because the the width wasn't there necessarily. <laughs> so it's just something to think about. We were in their half for more most of the game, so I think we were trying to get resources forward and create our own spaces against that, you know, tough low block. But it was just something that I, I noticed. I don't know if you noticed the same thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other thing too, right, is uh, Neto is literally like sitting off sides. Like he's that guy on <laughs> yeah. the game. You're like just cherry picking is we would call it in an American vernacular. Uh, but what it was good to see out of this is they, they rotated the runs out of the midfield, and that's where they created a lot of issues. So they were compact, but they were constantly uh, charging into space and overlapping and things like that. But it, it is a bit of a cluster here. If you look at Gens uh, on the opposite, I mean, they are they are huddled around the midfield line as well, but then three dropped all the way back to their 18, and that was the space we looked to attack. So uh, you got away with it today, right? Like had the it was a gamble you were able to make because of the opponents and things like that, but. Again, like I think the commitment to the cause, the energy with which this team plays is what gets me excited about it. Um, it gives me hope and and like they're willing to do the work on both sides. So I think that that's, um, that's helpful. And I think that that's something that we can build off of and continue to drive. Um, because if they're willing to work this hard in the UACO and they're willing to uh, try to show Maresca they can be relied upon in, in bigger matches and things like that, uh, we're starting to hopefully create that culture that remember when we talked to Joe Cole and he talks about the time under Mourinho and how you had to fight for every minute because you, there's someone or two people behind you ready to take your, your uh, spot. And that's the ideal situation uh, within Chelsea. So the question on everyone's mind, I think is let's pretend like this is the lineup for all six of the 
uh, as you would say, you are cool. Mm-hmm. Um, League stage, it's the league stage, not the group stage. Almost got that wrong again. The league stage matches. Do you think that this B team can easily coast through the league stage? So you got Panathinaikos. Apparently, we're playing a team called Noah. Mm -hmm. Correct. N O A H. Mm -hmm. Uh, Heidenheim, Astana, and the Shamrock Rovers. Without doing any homework, yes. <laughs> Look, Heid- Heidenheim is going to be probably the most difficult out of that. Um, For sure. A know, Bundesliga but, team, I'd imagine. Yeah. The, yeah. the rest of them are from, you know, small leagues, Ireland, Greece, no idea about Noah or Astana. Astana uh, is uh, Kazakhstan in December. Um, all right. It won't be cold at all. Don't worry about it. 9.30 a.m. Oh, yeah. So there's going to be a big time difference for that one, which oh, pushes yeah. it in. And remember, the times on these matches this year are all different. If it's a home match, usually it's at the normal, you know, kind of European night sort of vibe. But if it's an away match in a different time zone, they can be really early. They can, they're can they all off hours. So just yeah. look at your calendars appropriately uh, because holy shit. Um, what excites you the most, Brandon, about, yeah. the, about the league stage of the UAC? Um, opportunities for players. Like, again, we've seen young players either included in the squad, getting some minutes. Uh, the fact that it's boosting confidence at some point, you're going to need Philip Jorgensen to step in, Mm -hmm. uh, for Sanchez. It's just, it's inevitable. So for him to get these competitive minutes, like, I can't really remember the last time we had an opportunity like this to essentially like, you know, be playing two 11s every single week. Uh, to keep the fitness and the sharpness. Now, it's only six matches, right? So it's not going to be every every single week that we're doing this. But again, um, two in October, two in November, two in December. This is going to be such a good place for everybody heading into the festive fixtures, even the transfer window to really know kind of where we're at top to bottom. And uh, like I said earlier, I want to see the energy. I want to see the press. I want to see the working off the ball to both sides. And um giving them a chance to get creative and do some different things. Um, the through balls were excellent today. Um, a little bit sloppy. Like I think of, I think it was Vegas, like horror touch that ended up being a, an Nkunku goal. You're like, all right, great. That, that worked out nicely, but how can we start to tighten up some of these things? Like some of the shots, they were super sloppy off frame, um, poor decision-making, but these minutes are, are going to be what helped them in the end. I'm really excited for the away fans who have Greece up next. I think that's going to be pretty, pretty awesome for you guys. Um, I'll say what I'm most worried about uh, from the from the league stage of the UECL is uh, there will be moments, and I, I've already kind of called this out on a previous show, but there will be moments where we go super sane offensive lineup against like a Manchester United in the league. Are we capable of either playing Christopher and Kunku in both matches, right? In the, the um, Premier League and a, and a cup match? Or do we have the third striker, in this case, Joao Felix or Mark Guillou, able to step through and do the business? Like, I think, I think that's an area potentially where there's some you know, some opportunity for those two uh, in that way. I know Felix is not an out and out nine. I know that Giyu is. Giyu is very young. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in that. And my hope, you know, for, for that is that we just kind of do the best that we can with what we have. Maybe play, you know, in Kunku 60 minutes and someone else 30 minutes just to keep him fresh. Because at the end of the day, injuries are the the biggest thing that could derail a season for us right now. Like, if, if you know, God forbid, Cole Palmer ever got hurt, knock on wood salt over the shoulder or whatever like you have to figure out a way to replace that output and so i just hope everyone stays on the current trajectory obviously cole palmer's not gonna be playing in the in the ueco but um yeah that's that's what worries me the most anyway yeah so i was like looking through the teams fc noah is armenian league and uh that was the one thing was we were talking to everybody's we were uh qualifying was all these away days and these like new stadiums and i just know how much naz loves this and like how gary hayes would collect these scarves and things like when are you ever going to get a 50 50 scarf of chelsea and noah right and in uh all these clubs so it's just like 
super unique and things like that, which is awesome. So, uh, yeah, opportunity presents itself as up to these players to go and take it, and they have to. They should be pounding all these teams. They should be blasting them because the levels are, are just so different. The expectations are so different. Dewsbury Hall talked about it in the post-match presser. Um, they have to be tidy. Cut out the sloppy goals. Uh, dominate from minute one, and that will be their ticket to getting some better minutes. So we'll see how it goes, but it's a good spot to be in. So, All right, we're going to take a last ad break. When we get back, uh, looking at some of the performances, uh, Vega Bombs for all. Thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, so uh, some of the highlights, obviously, today. we uh, Vega getting the uh, player of the match. Uh, but it's a day out for the Portuguese, as we saw Nick in the three-word match review. Um, just just really, really strong from that contingency. Where do you want to start? Well, I, I think first I want to start with his like overall performance offensively and defensively. You know, we've seen, you know, in previous uh, matches, you know, obviously a new player to Chelsea, a very young player um, that he looked a little out of sorts. Right. Um, this was definitely a huge step up for him in terms of level of performance, uh, obviously aided by the goal, um, which was an excellent header from a Mudrick cross. Uh, Heaven Mudrick did exchange, I think, 25 passes today, which is amazing. Um, I don't think Mudrick has had that much service from the left side in some time. So that did feel good. But, um, you know, the, the goal is really good. It had to feel amazing for him uh, to kind of get that one off. Uh, off the docket and you know again I look at his average positioning I and mean, he burned a hole through midfield on the left hand side he was essentially playing the role that I expected Kieran and Dewsbury Hall to play which is that like deeper lying six like he was all over the map right there and has a decent amount forward too like he did get into attacking spaces and interchange well uh, but you know he made two interceptions he had three tackles you know he won all of his ground duels he won all of his aerial duels uh, you know, he, don't, he did lose possession a little bit. That's going to happen in the in this play style with the way that you pass the ball and try and be quick with it. Uh, didn't commit any fouls. Like this was a very very good performance. He got an assist as well. Like mm -hmm. I, I these are, I think this is a moment for the for the young man because I've been worried. Do we have that extra left back if if Chile's not available and he's not a part of this squad? Right. Do we have that extra left side, that extra left back? And he did show up in a big, big way today. Nine point three sofa score, uh, you know, for, for a guy who's been really in the upper fives, lower sixes on sofa score in previous games. I mean, that's a big jump up, Brandon. Not bad for a 21 year old. Um, look, he I highlighted him in the beginning of the season. I was like, OK, attention to him. I was like, he's got the profile. He, we have seen him play as a six. We have seen him play on the left, and he is versatile. So uh, good to to see him spin today. I, I will say, Ollie Glanville uh, <laughs> said that uh, he has all the ability to become an Alonzo style cult hero. So not skill, but the cult hero side of it, which I love. Yeah, yeah, because Alonzo was uh, was a whole different was a whole different cat, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really good for the young man. I'm happy for him. Definitely player of the match for me. You know, I think everyone agrees with that. Dan did not put an official Dan of the match poll out earlier, but I think let's just award it to the young man. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Pedro Neto with an 8.0 on SOFA score as well. What a, what a like, a, a common sense signing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, ahead of the season, I didn't really know we were linked to them. I Look, I was a bit disconnected this summer. But when you look at it, like, Hey, he's relevant. He's reasonable. Uh, all these different things, which are great. And so I thought it just we're seeing some really good things. He's mature, poised on the ball, uh, doesn't get rattled. It has the ability to create and score. Like it made sense. Was pretty pretty smart. Yeah, and and look, he did have a a pretty damn good performance today. I think the one thing that we all noted when he signed for Chelsea is that didn't have the best uh, defensive acumen. Let's say uh, I don't shot. think it was was forced to do a lot of that work at Wolves, I think was largely their their star creator and was given the freedom to do that. But he worked his ass off today. I mean, I think I think every one of the players did as well. But in particular, for guys like him and Matawake and, and Mudrik and guys who we have seen maybe not work as hard defensively, 
uh, Maresca is getting all of them to do the work and, and he did work his socks off and obviously scored for me, the best goal of the night easily. I mean, the shot is a ripper and he did the thing, Brandon, that I want all of our players to do, which is like, if you have a shot, just rip it, just see what happens because I, I, I hate walking it into the back of the net. I want us to score bangers. There were a couple of bangers tonight. I was very pleased about that. Like, just let it rip and see what happens. And it's into the roof of the net, uh, which shows his quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no doubt. So, uh, again, I think smart, smart piece of business. Not Should have had an assist as well. 100%. When, uh, when uh, both Batty Shield and Axel Sassi missed the ball. Ended up completely. in the goal. I should have had an assist. Yeah. So again, it was just say out of their normal profile, but like this is the kind of like experienced player. He was the leader for Wolves national team. Like this makes sense, uh, common sense signing, and so it's good to to see. Uh, Kieran Dewsbury Hall also getting an eight point zero and Sofa score, getting the post match presser with with uh, TNT Sports, not BT anymore. Point um, six four in the XG. Uh, had 91% accurate passes, one key pass, three for three on his long balls with a shot on target, and three dribble attempts. I mean, he's got six of eight ground duels won. Um, so that kind of just shows you he is that all-around midfielder. We know he scored a lot of goals from crashing the box late at Leicester last season. He's obviously Maresca's guy to, to help get the message across and show players what it takes to play Maresca ball. And uh, he had a really good day out on the right hand side really emotional celebration i think everyone was was very pleased for him uh as well you know i think it it was kind of summed up um uh, by by maresca as well where he said i'm over the moon i've been waiting for that moment uh dewsbury hall said this sorry i'm over the moon i've been waiting for that moment since the uh, since joining the club show everyone what my, what my qualities are uh, scoring the goal is an amazing feeling. I won't forget this night. I pride myself on working as hard as I can every day. I like to play. Uh, I'd like to play more, but it's my duty to make sure the manager has the decision to make. And like for me, Brandon, uh, not only was this a great moment for, you know, him and his development and how he, um, you know, is seeing the field, but he also played a handful of passes tonight that were truly excellent uh, through balls and over the top and, you know, interchanges. There was a lot, a lot happening in midfield with the, you know, the fact that Nkunku and Felix were dropping deep. It kind of created mismatch opportunities and he took them. And uh, Maresca did know, he's like, I'm, I completely understand how difficult things are at the moment for Kiernan. He was the main player at Leicester, joins Chelsea. You just become one of the guys, essentially. You are on the bench, not in the squad, not playing from the start. So you struggle a bit at the beginning but he has to understand the reason why he's here is because we want him. The celebration is probably because I know he needs that. That's the reason why. And Maresco only celebrated his goal really today. <laughs> um, but, you know, it had to feel good. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. boys from last year. And so, yeah, you know, that's uh, that's important. Yeah. Like I said, Charlie from Mighty Ducks, that's that's mm -hmm. his role on the team. But he's getting the minutes, getting to play. Let's see what he let's see what he can do. Right. At the end of the day, young English player. Um it's, it's all upside. You know, it wasn't, again, huge risk. He's more of a camaraderie player, but we we did get to see that goal. Good thing in Kunku stopped, right, because he was coming in crash and had a good view of it. And that's what we want to see. Good in the press, good in the energy, uh, connected with the attack, and uh, got her done, which is good. Uh, Mudrik, I think we have to highlight him. He's Mareska's talked a lot about Mudrik. He has not shied away from... The questions with him, he uh, clearly has been pulled back from really probably being top three when it comes to attackers, but he got the minutes today. And uh, I would say, surprisingly, Ghent gave him a lot of room to work. Yeah, it was, you know, I think he was like a 7.0 on Sofa score. Um, it was a pretty okay performance. I think the one thing I noted about Mudrik is, yeah, like you said, was given a lot of room to run at players. Did some take-ons, didn't do others. I was kind of confused by his methodology and when he picked to do that. But he did get into central areas a lot more today than he has. And I think that the fact that Vega was covering so much on the left and in the center 
allowed him more freedom and flexibility to maybe fill the hole that Felix was operating and, and switch with him a little bit. And so, you know, his, his assist actually comes from the right hand side as he follows a play through and crosses it back over to the left for, for Vega. And so it's a, it's an interesting one. I, I don't think it was like a barn burner of a performance, but it was better than we've seen him look all year. I think pretty conclusively. Yeah. Um, and Cuckoo's already tallied seven a little st- Seven goals on the season. Stat padding a little bit with uh, three in the UECO, three in the League Cup, one in the Premier League, um, which is good. But taking advantage of the different competitions isn't always a bad thing, right? You still have to score, which is important, especially when Ollie sends ridiculous tweets in our group chat. I told him this was making it in here, <laughs> and it was. There, uh, a tweet from uh, Danielle on, on on Twitter said there was a season where the top scorer had seven total, by the way, and uh, that was Jorginho. All of them were penalties. You remember that terrible season? Sure um, do. That was uh, that was tough. Uh, so uh, Nkunku already has seven. It's October 3rd, uh, which means, uh, you know, the likelihood is that he's going to uh, do – Get to uh, eight. Quite well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe get, nine. Get to eight for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, how are my predictions going? Uh, so, look, Tosin and Batty Shiel, okay. Benoit, he's still not getting his feet underneath him this this season. It makes it a couple seasons now. I think Tosin looks pretty good overall. Like, again, yeah. for a free transfer, seems like a tidy bit of business, but – um yeah, not not the best for Benoit so far. I I thought Benoit was okay today. Uh, there were some passes that you know he played through that were really excellent. You know, I thought he had a a really good first half in particular. But he is the guy on side for uh, their you know uh, the first goal for Ghent. and you know he's he's the only guy that's kind of out of the line in particular. And it, I I'm curious if that's a like him being nervous that he's going to get blown by or, or, or what, but it is, it, it's, it's notable when you look at the back line, especially when they're in the three, that he is always the one that feels a little deeper and they're going to have to figure that out. They're going to have to tighten that up pretty significantly. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, the goals are the conceding is, is where the problem's at. I don't think we're going to be able to score four every single match. Uh, even though, uh, Sam has given us the stats to, to run it back. Uh, Cast today obviously got some love from Reska, which you would hope so. They know each other. Hmm. So Ben yeah. Jacobs, uh, with the quote after the match, says he was very good against Barrow and even better tonight. He is very big and physically strong on the ball. He is improving a lot. He played one touch a lot. He's moving in the right direction. End quote. Gotta love it. Nick had a great night tonight. He has a mustache. A right and a left foot, and he's he's getting quicker. It's great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. listing off physical attributes. <laughs> you moresked me. That's oh, that's really man. something. I don't know. It's it's good to see. I look. I think the only thing I'll say on Cassidy is you always were going to be worried about his minutes when he was what I would say kind of stuck at the club once mm-hmm. the season once the window closed. It's good to see he's getting some. Obviously, not as much as last season, but he's going to be included in these types of matches and being trusted. Um, it could end up being a good a good fit in the end for him, which is which is important. Cool. Hey, so wrap up here. We've got a few questions from the audience. Uh, Leogic saying, "Is it realistic to win the Conference League and compete for the Premier League title this year?" And if not, what should the ceiling of expectations be? First, can we just talk about, are we really talking about winning the Premier League? I'm not. Uh, our boy is. So is it realistic to win both? No. <laughs> it is not It is not realistic to, to win both. I mean, I've said on the league in particular, you know, from a top four perspective, not even from like a league winner perspective, talk to me at the end of November after we make it through that brutal stretch of games and let's see where we are. If we come out of that unscathed, we have something to talk about. If we don't and we're, you know, we drop down to seventh, eighth again, and we're losing points and we're conceding a bunch of goals. 
you know, not like I'm wishing that, but like that is a distinct possibility, then, you know, then that answer is going to be pretty uh, easy to identify. I mean, I, if, if you're not competing for the for the conference league, that's simply because you chose not to, not because the competition was too hard, um, you know, so. You know, maybe there will be a stage later in the year, Brandon, where that's where, where we have to make that difficult choice. And you know, we're second in the league. We're fighting Man City and Arsenal's in seventh because they had a terrible collapse. A, a boy can dream. That's all. For sure. And uh, again, we've had a very favorable start to the season, to sure your has. point. And yep. the good news is we've taken care of business up to mm-hmm. this point. Obviously, the city match, but overall gone well. So I just think Leogic, one thing at a time. Um, winning the conference league, especially with the ability to change your roster after the the league portion is is crucial. And so it's like, cool, once you advance, you can bring in some of those players, obviously Cole Palmer mainly, and uh, boost those odds significantly. Uh, Augusto says, how do you guys feel about the Cassidy Dewsbury Hall midfield? Uh, it's light. <laughs> It's pretty light. Um, there's not a whole lot of defense happening in midfield right now uh, when, when they play together. But, um, you know, in a game like this where you have 70% of the ball, it, you can afford for it to be light. You know, I think that's the the benefit of kind of the the three center backs that you play with Tosin, Benoit, and, and DeSassi is you have those three back there in case something gets through. And, you know, I think, you know, for, for these conference league games and the Carabao Cup games, like, you, you definitely can get away with it. It's not – what I would prefer to happen. I'd prefer to have, you know, Dewsbury Hall and Lavia, for example, or Dewsbury Hall and Enzo. But, you know, I think that's that's probably not going to happen until Lavia is healthy again. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. It's it's okay. Thankfully, we don't need it to be great right now. And it's good to build the minutes and uh, expose them to some situations. But yeah, it's uh, not the most defensive. They're both the same. Like Cassidy wants to go box to box. He wants to get involved in attack. Dewsbury Hall is the same thing. Like a lot of touches. Um, there, yeah, there's no defensive minded player back there in that situation. But again, today didn't need it. So uh, it is fine. Uh, EB says, is William ready to take over the starting keeper spot from Robert? Yeah. Tell us. Uh Good news. Uh, he has a soccer ball, and we th- I just throw it at him. A lot of times it just hits him in the stomach and bounces off, and he laughs. Every now and then he'll snag it, and he'll like trap it against his body. So not ready, but a hey, preparation underway. And it is just uh, interesting. Like Sanchez had two good matches, and then immediately regressed back to the mean. You're like, okay, uh, what do we have here? And yeah. so uh, we'll see. I know I posted the video in the beginning of the season saying, hey, we had the 23rd best goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> in the Premier League. Then he went on a bit of a run, and now we're back at kind of like the average of it. But, um, yeah, it's uh, I'm going to shoot above Sanchez just for everybody out there. What, I'm on it. What kind of transfer fee are you going to command for William when they come calling? That's the real question. I mean, whatever talking- gets me retired. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> uh, Chris L says, and Kuka only staying healthy and scoring goals because BB Busby has been away. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a tactic. Nick sat inside the bar of the stadium at Stanford Bridge for an entire half just to make sure we won a Champions League match. Like, sometimes you do things for your team. For the greater good. Absolutely. So, uh, if this is what it takes, uh, balloon me. I'll be in the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> there is there's such a thing as correlation and causality. Uh, there is some correlation here. The causality yet to be determined. Yeah. Uh, he hasn't tagged me on IG thanking me yet, so it's not <laughs> official. All right. Uh, look, long story short, get manager. Wooter thinks that we're going to win. It's the best Chelsea team. I agree. You you look up and down the table. You've got a Fiorentina team there. Uh, you've got... Sorry, you got Heidenheim. Lot, you got Heidenheim. Yeah, Copenhagen. Sorry, there's just 36 teams. I have to scroll a lot. Real Betis. Uh, you know, like th- there's not a lot of teams, and especially if Chelsea going to play at the level they have been, yeah, they should be the favorites and they should go do something in this competition. But uh, Chelsea are tied on three points. It's first match week. It's literally, you know, two. Uh, anyways, it's it's early days, but like this is a good first step. Let's get. We got to be undefeated, right? We we said it earlier. Like, look in the league to this point, this conference league league stage. Chelsea won, 
Noah, your your boys won yeah. their first match. Yep. Right. So that's good. They they're on three points. Uh, Heidenheim won their first match. Astana won their first match. Panathinaikos got a draw, and Shamrock Rovers got a draw. And it's weird because like we don't all play the same teams, right? No. Like this is this is not a serious competition. <laughs> Like you could be playing uh, lame, or is that Larna? Anyways, uh, and Petro Cub, and just like walk the table, and someone else is going through a bit of a blender and doesn't make it. Like this is hilarious. UEFA put the interns in charge of this one. All right, boys. Here's a whiteboard, and you have three hours and a and a case of beer. Get her done. Let's. But you go. can't use anything that we already have. That's the key. <laughs> No crossover from the Champions uh, of Europa League. Start from scratch. Jake, hit the stinger one more time just for the seriousness of the competition. You know? There you go. Bam. The DJ horn. <laughs> All right. Look, tidiness on a midweek match. You got to prep for the weekend again. But uh, look, it's good to see the second 11 play. It's good to see four goals go in. The two conceding, not great, but it's really only one. Love to see the shithousery from the fans back and forth. Overall, like nothing but success, top to bottom. Continue the drive for the team, Nick. But it's uh, so far so good for Chelsea. Uh, go listen to the Forest preview that Sam and Dan put out on Wednesday. Um, shout out to producer Jake for working through Hurricane Helene, and obviously thoughts with everyone who uh, both went through that and has, you know, lasting damage from that storm. I mean, it is, it's crazy. Some of the images coming out of North Carolina are insane. So, um, you know, that's, that's important. And, uh, yeah, we're back on Sunday forest, tricky old forest. Callum Hudson, a put it on the scorecard. Now yeah, no let's doubt. see what we see what we can do. All right, Chelsea fans. It's good to hear from you again. I appreciate you pressing me back into the pot. It's always uh, a, an enjoyment that I can have when I get to look forward to it. But anyways, Chelsea fans, until next time, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>